Marty Calderon runs God Touch Milwaukee, but he says the man who really runs the show is Nicholas Hackbarth, and his faith journey is going to be a good one. Steve the Homer True is the man who came up for this wonderful idea, he and the Holy Spirit. My faith with Homer and Pippin, our tremendous producer, Brent Yunk. I am Tommy Pippins, and Homer's going to tee it up with Nicholas Hackbarth, and we are so grateful to have him with us today. I don't know anything, but I know this. If he's recommended by Marty, oh, baby, this is going to be good. <laughs> Nicholas, you start with your faith wherever you want. All right. Yeah, you know, um, before I came to God Touch Milwaukee here, um, I was a complete stranger to anything about a relationship with Christ, what it meant to be uh, walking with Christ in faith, um, you know, what a fervent prayer was, anything like this. You know, I've been in the program. Um, I've been with God Touch for about two and a half years now. And uh, if you had told me two and a half years ago that I'd be praising the Lord and uh, spreading that joy to other people, um, I would have told you to go fly a kite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got that. Now, how did it happen? Marty being involved seems, I'm sure, to be a huge part of it. But what happened? Absolutely. Yeah. I um, struggled with uh, alcoholism. Um, I was a big drinker. I uh, gave about 10 years of my life uh, to something, you know, substance abuse. Um, at the root cause of it was uh, unforgiveness um, towards people in my life. And I wasn't sure how to combat that um, using worldly devices, you know, just trying to, uh, I got in the habit of curing symptoms rather than treating the root issues. And a good friend of mine, I was working at Guitar Center at the time, um, and uh, he had gotten me uh, in connection with his mom, Pastor Lori. Uh, Pastor Lori, turns out, is on the board of God Touch Milwaukee. And uh, so her son, Craig, is the one that actually got me in contact with her. And she forwarded me Marty's number. And um, it, was, uh, it was a big change in life, you know, used to doing what I was used to doing. And then coming here, living in a structured environment um, directly under Marty's um, Marty's direction um, took me, uh, has taken me this far, so. Well, wait a minute. People have someone enter their life, but that doesn't mean they have to listen to them or agree to it. <laughs> Based on the strength of what you were doing, now I need even more as to yeah. why, what they said and why you listened. Um. Well, I'll say this. Um, I was used to doing what I was doing in life, and it wasn't producing anything. I knew that I was not living up to my potential and wasn't fulfilling my purpose in life, but I didn't realize until I got here and uh, started having my eyes opened exactly how unfulfilled I was. Um, when I got, you know, so to, to backtrack a little bit, um, I had to wait two weeks. Marty made me wait two weeks to get in here. And he kept reminding me that it was a faith-based program. Nick, this is a faith-based program. I want you to know this. And I was like, yeah, Marty, I get it. I get it. Is there a bed open? Can I come in yet? Can I come in yet? You know, I did this for two weeks with him. And uh, I got here. And uh, one gift that I always did have was uh, being able to pick up and start new, start afresh, and more so dive into it. I was here to do something different. I was told by the other gentleman when I, the first day that I arrived here, what you put into this program is what you're going to get out of it, and then some. And this is, um, you know, proof where I'm at now that when you do something wholesome like this, when you change your life, when you are in it to win it, that things truly do pay off. Every time you say something, I have five more questions. First of all, this was not the first time someone introduced you to God, Jesus, a faith. What had been your interaction with religion your entire life? Tell me that story prior to joining Marty's group. Okay, so this was my preconceived notion. I grew up in a fairly small town, you know, it was predominantly Lutheran churches. And, um, you know, we did the, you know, Christmas, Easter, you know, traditional type services. Um, I was never part of a church. A family wasn't really heavily involved in church. So, you know, unfortunately, my, my notion of, uh, you know, growing up in a small town, um, people typically attended churches. Um, or services rather, because if they weren't at church, um, the other people would recognize that they weren't at church and talk about the people that weren't at church. You know, so it was more of a saving face thing than a, a spiritual thing. And I just never put the two together. 
you know, so now understanding what it is to have a relationship with Christ, I was blown away. What's the first thing you were told when you entered Marty's group? Because I have no way of knowing how or why you would believe it, given the history you just gave me. Yep. So, uh, you know, just uh, being bold as Marty is, you know, uh, with Christ in his life, I wanted what he had. I've always been one to find somebody that has what I like and then do similar to what they have and follow their actions and I'll have similar results. Might not be exactly the same, but similar. Um, you know, how God designed us to have each in our own purpose, but God is the center of that. Um, you know, with Marty telling me, you know, first of all, it's not the program that's going to change you. It's the God in the program that's going to change you. You know, this is just four walls and a roof. What, what the difference here is, is including God in that, in that building. Okay, he okay. says, God in the program. I'll yeah. be Nick. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard this story before. But no, what? Hmm. It's a formidable question. Hmm. I guess it was one of the first Bible studies that we had, and it might have even been the first day that uh, understanding that I was broken, um, that my I had some heart issues going on, and that um, you know I had, you know, with the, the family separations um, that I had caused, you know, with the with the alcohol abuse and such, um, I didn't really have anyone in my corner for me, or didn't realize um, that the help that I was received was just ill spent, you know, on on bad habits. But um, getting to the point where understanding that I am broken and that's okay you know, redefining what it is to be a man, a godly man in society that Marty brings in people that he sees leadership potential in. And he, he's um, designed the program to unlock that leadership potential in the men that are here, you know, not only for yourself to be a leader, but in your home, your family, your relationships, the community at work, all of these facets of life, you know, this, you know, just to have um, God in all of it, that you're not relying on your own understanding and that you're using that godly wisdom and advice to move forward in life in the steps that have already been placed for you. It may seem that I go backward every time you go forward, but I want you to know, I know there will be thousands of people watching this, listening to this, who know a Nick and dream that what could happen to their Nick happened to you. Yeah. That's why I ask a weird question. Explain to us how bad it was and how long it was bad to help these people who I know are going to listen and watch and try to compare you to a person in their family or themselves. Sure, absolutely. I'm more than happy to. So uh, this all started out about, uh, I got my first DUI 2008. Um, that's when I, when I started drinking pretty heavily. I was, uh, boy, what was I, 23 at the time, 2008. I uh, got my first DUI and then, uh, you know, through the process and all that, you know, I continued drinking. I wasn't driving, but I was still drinking. Um, I got my second DUI in 2000, excuse me, I got my first DUI 2006. I was 21. I got my second DUI in 2008. I was 23 and I got my second DUI only a month after I had gotten my license back. Um, so I made a conscious decision. I knew I wasn't going to quit drinking. So I purposely didn't buy a vehicle for almost five years because I knew you know, drinking, quitting drinking was out of the question. I wasn't doing that. Um, you know, so I, I biked around town, worked various jobs, you know, that were, you know, in relative proximity to where I lived, just, just for the fact of, you know, ease of travel, things like this. Um, but it started out, you know, beer, going out to the bars, things like this. And then about, uh, let's say 2010 is when I started drinking regularly. You know, that's when the, my life transitioned from drinking was the release to, everything else was just time spent in between drinking. Um, you know, that's where I started switching over to, um, you know, I always had a bottle of something, this vodka, you know, whatever it may be, but that's when I switched over to the spirits. Um, and that's when I started drinking, you know, as, as a lifestyle, um, rather than any kind of reprieve or fun. Um, you know, and I transitioned from going out, enjoying that time with friends to now drinking at home because it was easier, it was cheaper, you know, all these mental faculties that, you know, or, you know, principles, well, it's cheaper and I can do it here and I can do it when I want to. Um, and then it just started integrating itself into every part of my life, you know, so 
all in all said, um, I was um, oh, probably about 25 when that happened, about 2010, and then uh, up until 2019 when I came to God Touch. So for a good nine to 10 years, um, I went from drinking to satisfy and numb, you know, being that functional alcoholic to drinking until I passed out now. And I would do that three, four, five times a day. You know, I would binge drink, pass out, wake up, do the same thing. Um, you know, and I found myself over that 10 years time taking jobs that paid considerably less and less and less only to feed the habit, you know, where I had it down to a science where I knew I had to drink this much per amount of time to get this amount of buzz. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else know that you were such a huge mess? Um, within reason, I stayed pretty close and shut doors. I knew that there was cause for concern. Um, in about 2013, uh, one of my real good friends at the time, you know, she said, Nick, you need to quit drinking. Um, and I can still hear that in my ear and it's, it's ingrained in my mind. But I, I said, you know, that's, that's for other people. I don't have a problem. Um, you know, so it was denial on my behalf. Uh, but that's when I started losing family connections, friend connections, things like that, you know, because I thought they wanted me to, to be the person that I was when I was drinking. No, they just wanted to know the person. They wanted me to be the person that I was when they first met me. You know, so there was always a small break in window where I would be more conscious of my drinking. And then once I got comfortable with people, then I would just let it loose like I had been, you know, behind closed doors. When did you know it was yes? And how many times did you say, I'm going to change and never did? Oh, boy. Um, I probably said I was going to quit. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just going to put a, a number out there. We'll call it 50 times. We'll say that, you know, could be once a week and maybe every, you know, six months, something like that time in between. You know, there were days I would drink and I'm like, man, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep doing this? Nothing good is coming out of this. Uh, the final straw, which still didn't stop me, by the way, and I'll share this portion of the story. Um, in 2018, um, I was at probably the peak of my alcohol intake and I actually put my liver into failure. My liver shut down, so I stopped digesting everything and um, my stomach ballooned up. My body just stopped processing everything. And uh, my stomach was so big and so hard, I finally called an ambulance and they took me to um, Aurora Hospital. I lived in uh, Clintonville, Wisconsin at the time and they took me to Green Bay in the ambulance. And uh, they had this big like um, two liter bottle, you know, size bottle with a needle about this long so it could puncture into my stomach. And they pulled um, almost two liters of straight beer and alcohol out of my stomach. And uh, I was in the hospital for about six days. And, uh, you know, the doctor told me that, you know, I was uh, showing signs of cirrhosis, you know, the fatty infiltration in the liver, that if you continue to drink like this, you will die. So, but. Uh, so from, from when you recovered to how long before you met Marty? Your story doesn't make sense because I don't know why or how you would ever change. Yeah, you know, it, um, so it went like this for me. So as soon as I got out of the hospital, I ended up taking a taxi ride home, which is about a 45 minute ride from Green Bay to where I lived at the time. And um, I was, I, I had it in my mind. This is it, I'm gonna finally quit. You know, and I got excited, but when I got home, I had all those emotional attachments, the memories, the, you know, this is my regular day. So I, I kid you not, you know, within 10 minutes of being home, I was on my way to the liquor store after just getting out of the hospital. And um, so, you know, this now, um, the end of uh, 2018. So in January, I got fired from my job because I went on a three day bender. Um, I didn't realize it had been three days. I started drinking on Saturday. And by the time uh, my boss came knocking on the door to get the keys for the store, I was a key holder um, at the job I was working at at the time. Um, it was Tuesday and I hadn't realized it. And um, so I, I know this is, you know, painful to say for me out loud. Uh, but the thing that actually stopped me from drinking is I literally spent um, the last of my change on four packs of steel reserve. 
And then until I literally ran out of money where I couldn't purchase anymore, um, was, was finally the determining or the, de uh, determining fact of me quitting drinking. So I had no choice, but to. And that was when, and take us from that time forward. Okay. So that would have been next week. Yep. So that would have been about February when, uh, all my money was drained, gone. And, uh, so, you know, the landlords were, were patient with me. They bless their hearts. Um, you know, they were patient with me. They let me slide a little bit for February. I paid most of it, but not all of it. March, I told them, you know, I'm looking for work. I'm looking for work. You know, and then April finally came and uh, they came by and I had gotten my hands on a few dollars from a friend and I was out on the porch drinking, you know, these cans right out in the front of the porch. And uh, they finally said, that's it. We've had it. You know, you got to go, you know, so I got evicted in April and, um, so April 27th is when I left the apartment that I was living in. And uh, my friend Craig, um, who was the one that uh, his mom is Pastor Lori, uh, put me up in his house uh, for about two weeks while this whole transition happened when I was in contact with Marty, um, waiting to get into the program. And uh, so, you know, the, the first step, and I, I, I was sweating even before I got to his house because um, you know, we've got a, a few mutual friends, you know, we did side jobs, roofing, siding, things like this, um, construction type jobs, and they all told him, do not go and pick him up, he's going to use you. And, you know, and this is coming from five, six, seven different people that we both know. Um, I didn't find this out until after the fact until I got into God touch. Um, but against all of their advice, he still came and got me. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to play God, but if I did, I would say, uh, you understand, Nick, you should be dead. It's yeah, hard sure do. to explain how you're still alive. Does that thought cross your mind? Absolutely. You know, and I, I'm at a point now where I actually hate the thing that I used to do because it produced nothing good in my life. And um, it, it very well could have taken my life, you know. Um, yeah, sorry. Mm. Mm. it's incredible to me that you know for 10 years time that I damaged my body so badly that when I go to the doctor now you know I do my my regular checkups you know I'm <laughs> you know doing doing my my due diligence on my health and um there there is no remaining evidence or anything that I ever drank like I did you know so wow. you know by by all miracle of God that you know, he healed me in, in you know, <clears throat> completely from, from the, the same thing that took my life and keep me separated from him um, as well as he did, you know, to almost a 100%, you know, uh, rehabilitation level. I, I can't express my joy in that by, you know, by, by words alone, you know, and I, you know, and that, that strictly goes to, you know, that heart connection. He knew what I wanted to do. He knew that when I got a hold of him, um, but what I was going to do with the gift he was giving me. What or how can you describe your relationship? Do you go to church a lot? Do you pray a lot? What is what has occurred between you and yeah. the Lord? Okay. Uh, so the first six months I was here at God Touch, you know, like I said, you know, I was I was completely oblivious to any of it. So, you know, going to Bible study prayer. Um, so the, the short and sweet of it is every day I'm in a Bible study, sometimes two. Um, every day I'm in prayer. Um, you know, the, the constant reminders, I've got a couple of uh, the Bible apps on my phone that just shoot me prayers throughout the day or uh, prayers and verses, you know, to keep my mind. You know, it breaks up the, uh, the, the daily busy, the, the hustle and bustle of the day, um, being plugged in, you know, keeping my mind on what's important and uh, making sure I'm not paying attention to what's the loudest, but staying founded in what's the most important. This doesn't deal with your faith. My father was an alcoholic, didn't drink for the last 50 years of his life. And I asked him, how was it? He says, I miss it every day. Yeah. He wanted to stress to me how hard it was and it never got easier. And faith was a huge part of his recovery. Mm -hmm. Is that, is his statement accurate? Um, I would say that's not been my experience. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm two and a half years in now. And I would say probably after 
for a good year now. I don't, I don't crave it. I don't want it. When I see it, it doesn't trigger me anymore. Um, it's just not part of my lifestyle. You know, for me, it was, you know, direct sin nature for me to go out and drink because I abused it the way that I did. It's not a sin for all people to drink. I just took it to that, to that next level where it was causing separation between me and God because I, I treated it like an idol. It was the most important thing in my life. Um, not condoning anyone to drink, but at this point, I need to stay sober. I need to be vigilant. I need to be sober minded because now I need to spread the joy and the, the cause of the Lord to the men that are in the program. And that's much more valuable, valuable to me exponentially that even thinking about drinking alcohol is not an option. And I emphasize again, I know people are thinking, Nick, tell us how I can have my Nick, how my daughter, son, relative yeah. can become like you. Yeah. How does it, how can I help them? What could, how to do it? Sure. So my, my best advice, you know, and this again is my experience, but uh, you know, with other guys that uh, I've seen come through God Touch Milwaukee, the hardest part about an addiction is the mental choice to, to quit, to stop that addiction. You have to have your mind made up. If you're not ready, you're not ready. Um, that's the biggest determination. You know, it only takes 12 days to create a new habit, whether you're quitting something or starting something new, 12 days. Um, you know, so if you want to look at it scientifically from that standpoint, um, any physical ramification that you have at any type of addiction will be gone 12 days. You know, you have to rewrite new memories with, with profitable new good memories. You know, those, you know, just like a hard drive on a computer, you know, you can point and click and delete files and take this and move these over here and delete those and categorize these over here. Well, your mind isn't that easy, you know, in its, in its physical sense, you can take those memories, you can include good people around you and rewrite those memories over time, you know, and that time you have to understand is a gift from the Lord. We, you know, time isn't just freely given, you know, we're here for a purpose because he's not done with us yet here. Um, but again, you know, making the choice to quit is the hardest decision. The physical follow through comes by making the decision to want to quit. It has to be a want. You have to be ready. My theory on even not just yours, not just you is, it's someone who says, all right, God, be it the Holy Spirit, you and I, we can do this. Help me. Yeah. Let's go. I need your help. I need your help. And it is that help, that desire for help, that is also a huge part of it. Do you buy any of that theory? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, like, like when I first got here, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I've learned now you can't, you can ask God questions, but you can't question God. Ask him to show himself to you in very simple ways. Lord, show me something that only you can do. Come up with very specific things that only he can do. And when you start seeing these things reoccur, you know, time after time after time in different scenarios and different facets of your life, you know, I'm, I'm going to use this very loosely, but that was my selling point. Okay, I got it. You're there. And in my last story before Tommy takes over, I don't claim that it's perfect, but when people want to beat a demon, I say yep. the stats are unbelievable. You add God and you do it with God, you got the best chance by far. And that's just my theory. There are so many stories and everybody, almost everybody who beats it, it's always God. They're a team. They're partners in some way. Do you buy that? Absolutely. Okay, so it's like this for me, you know, God is never going to tempt you, he will test you, but not tempt you, he will never lead you down a, a, a path astray. So just like a teacher in school, when you take the test with the person that created the test, chances are you're going to pass the test. I defer to Tommy, he says this, Homer's got like 20 questions when I ask questions, when he asks questions, now I know he's got 20. <clears throat> Well, Nicholas, I think the one thing that's been going through my mind as listening to you in this powerful testimony, Nicholas Ackbarth from God Touch Milwaukee on My Faith with Homer and Pip, the tremendous pain that you had to be. And with addiction comes the guilt and the shame, but yet unable to release it. Can you talk about that pain? And now as you look back, can you talk about the emotions that you must have when you consider the love that God has for you, certainly as we're in this Christmas season, manifesting itself and God breaking through time and becoming God incarnate. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, you know, I, I used alcohol divisively to not only mask the mental pain that I was dealing with, uh, but, you know, just the physical depression, um, all that type of stuff, you know, not only was it um, keeping me in a hole, um, but, uh, you know, when you're when you're down in that hole, the only voice that reverberates back to you is your own voice and your own thoughts. So when you stay in isolation like that, there's nothing good being poured into you. You're only left to your own devices to continue furthering, you know, the depth of the hole that you're in, um, you know, and, and it, it, you know, for, for being blind, you know, you know, 10, 12 years worth of time and to see where I'm at now, you know, simple verses, even, even simple thoughts or emotions now that I have, you know, they well up in me and it's, it's no longer, um, you know, when I, when I cry, it's no longer sorrow. It's no longer pain. It's tears of joy. Um, because I'm beyond all that. And it's in, there's no words for, um, there's no words for the, the emotional welling that, that happens like that when it's, when it's purely joy focused. I'm amazed that yeah, Homer's experience late and great dad was, his faith was huge, but there was that temptation every day. You hear about recovering alcoholics. You're always a recovering drug addict, whatever it might be. Yeah. But for you, God just, it seemingly took it all away. And I wonder if there's a correspondence or a correlation, Nicholas, between that and you're now paying it forward with your faith to help others who have been in such pain and have felt so hopeless and perhaps wanted to end it all. Yep, absolutely. So it was like this for me, you know, so in the world, um, the doctor told me I suffer from alcoholism. It was a disease. You're going to have this the rest of your life. I come to God touch. We get into scripture and I learn that in Christ, you are a new creation. Old things are gone and new things are to come. Old things passed away. That man that you were is no longer here. He's dead. He's buried with Christ. The, that stuff is on the cross. That's gone. I am no longer Nicholas Hackbarth, the alcoholic. I am Nicholas Hackbarth, reborn in Christ. It sounds like addicted to scripture, addicted to Bible study. Is that is that accurate? That's that's a fair statement to be had. Yeah. <laughs> Nicholas used uh, a word, unforgiveness. Yes. How has your journey with the Lord and His forgiving you helped you to forgive others? You know, um, you know, so the situation that I referred to was with my mother. Um, you know, I found out that uh, I had a, a biological father that I didn't know about until I turned 18. And I started asking questions. And uh, when it finally came to light, you know, there was a piece of mail that had, you know, Nicholas Scharninghausen on an envelope. And I was like, Mom, who is this? And then and then the finally the story broke free. So for 18 years of my life, I didn't know that I had a man out there that was my biological father, you know, and I, you know, um, a stepdad that was taking care of me that I called dad, you know, for my whole life. It was just the resentment that, you know, am I the only one that doesn't know, you know, kind of a thing, you know, who else knows in the family? And uh, it was it was that that caused the separation between my family greatly, you know, both mentally um, I started moving away, things like this. And that's when um, I picked up the, the alcohol uh, to start curing my symptoms, you know, you know, temporarily. Um, but, um, you know, at this point, you know, it, it came to me, you know, shortly after I got here to God Touch that, uh, you know, I'm human and I have my own secrets as well, you know, that only God and I know. And how dare I hold my mother to such a standard that she wouldn't have her own secrets. And just that simple, you know, I'm, I'm going to use this lightly, the word simple, but that that simple root of unforgiveness was layered in every aspect of my life. You know, it caused, you know, passive aggressive natures. It was, it allowed me to use people for my betterment. You know, it didn't matter. I was very selfish. I was manipulative. Um, I only mm -hmm. included people um, just so I could get what I wanted, um, you know, and it, it's one of those things that, you know, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole loaf, um, you know, just letting that little bit in took over my entire life to where I was manipulating people and using them for my own benefit, not, not looking out for their well-being. Um, you know, so when I first got here, um, the gentleman that was the home director at the time, 
you know, showed me, took me in and showed me the lifestyle that I could be living. And because I was showing it the first day that I got here and it was something completely different that I had ever known or seen or experienced, um, that is my main mission here now is the guys that come in to show them what I experienced. And so they can get out of this program, you know, see the God in the program, what they are capable of to build them up as spiritual leaders. Hmm. The aforementioned Marty Calderon, the, the MVP, right, the executive director of the Hot Show at God Touch Milwaukee, said that it was actually your dad who had struggled but had been making strides who helped turn Marty's life around. Would you be able to do that? <laughs> Absolutely. Like, so this is, again, you know, one of those, you know, God stories. You can't plan for this. You can't make this stuff up, you know, so... Uh, my dad's name, Don Scharninghausen, you know, rest his soul. He ended up getting in a motorcycle accident back in 2016. But um, so back in the late 90s, Marty was um, an attendee at Teen Challenge. And my dad, Don, was on staff at Teen Challenge at the time. Um, and I've heard some, uh, I'm going to, you know, use this, some horror stories about, about Don, Brother Don. And, uh, you know, making people cut and grass with scissors and, you know, things weren't done right, you know, you know, just very, very severe ramifications. Um, but with all that said, you know, it's um, how, how God brings everything together. And um, I never got to know my dad personally or experience the glory of God in him physically, but the fact that Don was able to impart wisdom to Marty when he was at Teen Challenge. And now that I'm under Marty, um, wisdom that my dad shared with Marty is now in me as well. And you know, your dad is in heaven by God's grace, smiling down, very proud of you and living on through you, Nicholas. Homer, I know you're not quite done, are you? No, you know my favorite question. And it always, <laughs> and it's the same for Nick. When do you feel closest to God now? Huh. When do I feel closest? When it's the best, when you, it's almost like you can feel it more than you normally do. I guess it's when I see the spirit move through me and it's reflected back to me knowing that it's, it's that, um, Oh, how's the best way I want to describe it? The confirmation that his spirit is pouring out, out of me to somebody else. And I can feel that joy come back full circle. You know, it's definitely, we're, we're huge with community involvement and public interface uh, with people in the community here on the South side of Milwaukee. And it's, you know, some days 95% of the people um, are there to receive the stuff but that, that 5%, that one occasion, those two people that are there that are, you know, breakdowns are so thankful, you know, and maybe it's only once a week, but it's at those times that makes the rest of the week absolutely worth it because those people are going to go home, excuse me, and their life is going to be changed and they're going to change the, the hearts and the lives of the people around them that day. That's what it's all for. And then someone will go, oh, no, they're me a few years ago. Come on, how can I? I mean, you just explain when the touch happens and you realize I can't be this good. This is God and this is awesome. But the feeling it hasn't happened yet when you, you just wish you could help those people because you've lived it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know what I the even to all strangers that I come in contact with, you know, I, I typically ask whether I'm at Walmart, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, all I can promise you is it's all going to be all right. That's, that's what I tell them. It's all going to be all right. I promise you that. Um, to see people like that, and I, I tell them, you know, life doesn't have to be like this, you know, and if, and if they're curious, I'm not going to force anything on them. But if, if their curiosity is piqued, I'll have more than happy to sit down and spend the time with them. Absolutely. You know. You may be living your dream, but I am curious, looking ahead, what's your dream now? Oh boy. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. The Christian life is no cakewalk. Being prepared is key. The Lord just doesn't bless you to not equip you for something that you're gonna face. 
Um, I could have never dreamed, you know, to, the fact that I'm going to use this again, loosely call this work, um, I, I could never imagine or fathom. I, I couldn't ever describe, you know, some days I'm on a radio show, you know, today I'm with you guys, you know, other days we're doing outreaches, we're feeding people, you know, this is, this is what is work now for me, you know, classic quote unquote. Um, my goal from here, um, I have been, you know, planning, you know, I would like to start a small business of sorts where I could start becoming more of an asset financially um, to the growth of what God Touch Milwaukee is. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that is yet. All I know is that I'm still learning so much on a day-to-day -day basis about administrative duties, financial opportunities, um, fundraising opportunities, things like this, that um, I'm not going to use the word overwhelmed, but I'm at capacity where I'm still learning enough every day um, that it definitely hears me of any kind of, uh, you know, being bored or anything of this sort. So, um, you know, for, for right now, I'm going to focus on what uh, the Lord has for Marty to, to have me do at this point. Uh, but at some point, um, you know, I definitely would like to get into uh, small business ownership, entrepreneurial, you know, somewhere, not sure what field yet. Um, I've been gifted with a, with a few, you know, talents. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to play that, uh, you know, I'm going to sit tight for now until the Lord tells me to move and um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Tommy, you can close. <laughs> How awesome is it to know that the God who knew you before the beginning of time had a plan for you. You were called according to his purpose and as Homer indicates, I mean, there's, it's amazing what you have done and there's so much ahead. Do you ever stop and think and just, I, I don't know, can you even describe this indescribable love he has for you and has for all of us uh, who by his grace can surrender to and trust in him? Yeah, amen. You know, so, you know, this is going to sound, you know, this is just me speaking freely here. Uh, when I first started understanding and reading the Bible, I was like, man, this is like fantasy stuff out of a movie. You know, the <laughs> Lord that created me, that knit me together in my mother's womb wants to spend time with me and get to know me. Um, it was something that I really, you know, I, I wasn't prepared for mentally. And I was like, man, is this real? You know, and then, you know, these intuitive questions, God, show yourself to me here, there, there, um, you know, and, that, and as you stand firm in him, you know, you just grow and grow and grow and you work on your vertical, your vertical relationship with the Lord. So that way you can go out horizontally to the people here. You know, we, we pray that heaven come to earth, you know, we always pray for the father to come here. You know, and in, in, you know, my view now and my perception, you know, he also wants us to go up by him. You know, next time you call him into your presence, you know, think about it in the way that he wants you in his presence. He wants me in his presence, you know, that we can refresh ourselves, that we can be overflowing cups to other people. Absolutely. God touch your heart. And now with Marty and your team, Nicholas Hackbarth, you are helping touch Milwaukee. I think it's wonderful the peace that you have and uh the opportunity for all of us to share in that when it seems hopeless so thank you very much for being on my faith with homer and pip uh our wonderful producer is brent young he's the one who connected us with marty calderon nicholas because they work together so now we get connected as you point out god is very cool that way including when he put marty together with your late dad so thanks again as we speak right now uh, it is christmas eve day God bless you and all your loved ones, and, and we hope and pray that it's Christmas uh, throughout the year for all of us as we bask in the glow of his uh, indescribable love, unfathomable, whatever you might want to say. Thanks again, Nicholas. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, guys. Okay, for Nicholas Hackbarth, our producer Brent Young, and Steve the Homer True, he and the Holy Spirit came up with this idea. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. We hope that God has touched your heart through Nicholas Hackbarth. See you next time.